October 1978, New London, New Hampshire. 26-year-old Kathy Milliken was taking pictures and birdwatching at the Chandler Brook wetland area around New London. This would be the last time anyone would see Kathy alive. Kathy's body would be found the following day, only a short distance away from where she was last seen by witnesses. Her body would be found with 20 stab wounds. Her case remains cold. What did this case have in common with seven other murder victims scattered between the New Hampshire and Vermont border over a course of nine years? Does an eyewitness that barely survived the attack paint a picture of the killer? Are these attacks related? And who are the primary suspects? And could the killer have gotten away entirely? Today on Unblurring the Unknown, we dive deep and connect all the dots and leave no stone unturned in the case of New Hampshire's first serial killer, known as the Connecticut River Valley Killer. Welcome back to Unblurring the Unknown. I am your host, Dominic, and I just want to say thank you for tuning in to this week's episode. Now, I've doubled down on true crime slash unsolved mysteries in back-to-back -back weeks, except this week I'm diving into something a little different with a unsolved serial killer case. Now, I have looked into this case a little bit before, and um, I decided to cover it for this week's episode. So I have a little prior knowledge which helped me out in the long run. Now, I do want to state some of the themes that will be discussed in this week's episode can be graphic and or disturbing. And for that, I want to say listener discretion is advised. Now, before we get into the story of this week, I want to lay out how everything is going to flow and work before we dive right in. First, we are going to explain where this story takes place, the victims of the attacks and where their bodies were discovered, a survivor testimony and description of the attacker, possible suspects and leads in the case, and how that ties into our big suspect, and the other related instances that this person had over the course of their life. We will then wrap it all up at the end with some additional facts, and at the very, very end, we'll dive into theories of everything. So with that being said, let's get into the Connecticut River Valley Killer. Now, where does our story take place? Make no mistake when you hear the words Connecticut River Valley, this has nothing to do with the state, but rather the river named after the state. The Connecticut River spans all the way from just below the New Hampshire-Canadian border and flows southward for 406 miles and discharges into the ocean at Long Island Sound. Now, most of the killings took place in the southwest portion of New Hampshire and just over the Vermont border in the towns of New London, New Hampshire, Unity, New Hampshire, Heartland, Vermont, Newport, New Hampshire, Kellyville, New Hampshire, Saxton River, Vermont, and West Swansea, Vermont. This southern part of New Hampshire and Vermont, even though it is closer to the bigger cities, this area still has a very rural feel to it. Now, before we get into the victims and the killings, why has this case remained unsolved for as long as it has? And there are many reasons for this. Firstly, forensic science was not very great in the 80s. Most of the bodies were already decomposing, and some pretty badly at that, and we will get onto that later when we discuss victims and so on and so forth. Now, to add on to that, New Hampshire and Vermont has some of the lowest crime rates in the country. An incident such as this one would be unprecedented in the 1980s, and it was very realistic to assume that many local investigators and police departments haven't worked with this number of homicides before in such a short span, which could have led to not much knowledge and a lack of experience in homicides between the New Hampshire and Vermont regions. But there are a lot of other factors that played into why this case has remained cold for as long as it has, and why it's kind of reached a dead end, sort of speak, um, in terms of explanations. Now, on to the known victims of the Connecticut River Valley Killer. And when I say known victims, these are the ones that investigators believe are associated with the Connecticut River Valley Killer. Um, however, there could be more, uh, more undiscovered bodies. There could be um, other people who were killed by the Connecticut River Valley Killer, um, if he even existed. Um, 
However, those have not either been discovered or affiliated up to this point. So I am going with the seven known victims of the Connecticut River Valley Killer. Now, as I mentioned in the intro, the first victim of the Connecticut River Valley Killer was 26-year-old Kathy Milliken. In October of 1976, she was found dead in the Chandler Brook Wetland Preserve near New London, New Hampshire. Her body was discovered roughly a day after she was last seen. She was stabbed 20 times in a V-shape on her body. Now, kind of remember the the stab wounds in the shape of a V because that does come back later. Now, the next supposed victim of the killer was 37-year-old Mary Elizabeth Critchley. On July 25th of 1981, Critchley, who was a student of UVM at the time, so University of Vermont, disappeared while hitchhiking near the Massachusetts border. Her friend had dropped her off at the Exit 13 Turnpike in Framingham, Massachusetts, and Critchley was trying to hitchhike her way to Waterbury, Vermont. A week and a half passed until Critchley's body was found near Unity, New Hampshire on August 9th, 1981. Now, due to how badly her remains were decomposed at the time, the medical examiner couldn't determine a cause of death. Now, originally, you might think that this could be an isolated case. However, we will get into why this case is associated with the killer. The third confirmed and believed victim of the killer was 16-year-old Heidi Martin. On May 20th, 1984, Heidi Martin was jogging on Martinsville Road in Heartland, Vermont, when she disappeared. Her body was found the following day in a swampy area near the Heartland Elementary School. The murder of Heidi would be associated with the killer based on where the body of the, where the location of the body was discovered, excuse me. Um, it was also associated um, by Heidi being stabbed to death as well. The fourth victim would be 17-year-old Bernice Cordomanch, and I hope I pronounced that right. Just 10 days after the murder of Heidi Martin, Bernice Cordomanch was last seen around 3.30 p.m. on May 30th, 1984, in Claremont, New Hampshire. It was rumored that she was hitchhiking on New Hampshire Route 12 to get to her boyfriend's house, who lived in Newport. After not arriving, she was reported missing the following day. Bernice's body wouldn't be discovered until two years later, on April 19th, 1986, by a fisherman in the woods around Newport. The coroner determined her cause of death by getting stabbed to death, and she had stab wounds in her neck, a traumatic head injury, and a slit to the throat. Because of the manner in which she was killed, investigators believe that she was an associated victim of the Connecticut River Valley Killer. The fifth victim will be, would be 26-year-old Ellen Freed. She went missing just two months after Bernice's disappearance on July 22, 1984. She was using a payphone outside of Leo's Market in Claremont. While she was on the phone with her sister, Ellen said that she had noticed a car circling the parking lot when she was on the phone. Ellen thought this was extremely weird and started to get concerned. Ellen went to her car to make sure it would start before hanging up the call with her sister, and after she did, she hung up. This was the last time anyone would hear from her. Ellen worked as a registered nurse for the nearby Valley Regional Hospital, and when she didn't show up for work the following day, a red flag was raised. Her car was later found abandoned on Jarvis Road, not far from the payphone she used to call her sister. Her remains wouldn't be found until almost 18 months later, on September 19, 1985, when her body was found near the Sugar River. Her cause of death was due to multiple stab wounds, and evidence pointed as well to a possible sexual assault that took place. The sixth victim would be 27-year-old Eva Morse, who disappeared while hitchhiking home also on NH Route 12 between Charleston and Claremont, New Hampshire. Her remains would be found also in Unity, New Hampshire, only 500 feet from where Mary, Mary Critchley's body was found five years prior. She was also stabbed to death. The seventh would be 36-year-old Linda Moore, who, unlike the other victims up to this point, was actually murdered when she was home alone. This was the last scene. She was last seen in her backyard by her husband at 2 p.m. on the afternoon of April 16, 1986. Her husband left the house, and when he returned approximately an hour later, Linda was found murdered in the living room of their Saxon River, Vermont home. Now, Moore was sunbathing in the backyard of their home when her husband left the house, and it is believed this is when the attacker first struck. 
Now, there was a witness who saw several several men outside of the home before the attack, one of them being a man with dark hair and cheap black sunglasses on with a blue backpack. There was obviously a very violent scene at the home as it was clear Moore fought back against her attacker. The attacker, however, ended up stabbing her 25 times, the stab pattern being very consistent with the stab wounds found on both Cordomanch and Moore. And Morse, excuse me. Because of the multiple witnesses to the people outside of the Moore's house, investigators were able, put, able to put together a composite sketch of the man they described. And we will return to that photo later on in the episode. The final victim, or the final believed victim, of the Connecticut River Valley killer was 38-year-old Barbara Agnew. On January 10th, 1987, Barbara went skiing with some of her friends on Stratton Mountain. Even though the weather was less than ideal, with even blizzard-like conditions at times, Barbara left Stratton Mountain around 10 p.m. to head back to her home in Norwich. And that is in Vermont. She decided to stop at a rest stop only 10 miles away from her home. Why she decided to do that is unknown, considering she was so close to her home. Now, this could have been weather-related, it could have gotten really bad at that point, and that is the reason why she stopped, waiting for a break in the weather to finish her trek. However, it's also been speculated she could have stopped to get rid of some garbage or even make a call from a payphone. However, that is all speculation and that has never been identified. A few days later, her green BMW was found still at that rest stop. Her car door was still open and there was blood over her steering wheel and inside of the car. Two months later in March, her body would be found 12 miles from the rest stop in a wooded area right outside of Heartland. Her body had the same V-shaped stab pattern like many of the other victims, and her body was discovered only a mile away from where Heidi Martin's body was found just three years before this. Now that leads us to one more incident involving the killer, one in which the victim just barely escaped and lived to tell the story. Now, the only story that perhaps, and this is the only story that perhaps gives us prominent leads onto who the Connecticut River Valley killer was. This incident took place in August of 1988. Jane Borowski, who was seven months pregnant at the time, was stopped at a gas station in West Swansea, Vermont. While at the gas station, a Jeep Wagoneer pulled up alongside of Jane. A man exited the car, and she watched him walk around the back of her car and ask if the payphone was working. Before then walking up to her open car window, oh, so walking up to her open car window, excuse me, and violently attacking her and trying to pull her out of the vehicle. Now, we did manage to pull her out of the vehicle, and he ended up stabbing Jane 27 times before he jumped back into his Jeep Wagoneer and left her there, basically bleeding out on the pavement. Miraculously, Jane was able to make it back to her own car and drive it to her friend's house. Shockingly enough, the car in front of her was the Wagoneer. As Jane made it to her friend's house, basically following the Wagoneer the entire way there, the attacker knew it was her and pulled a U-turn in the road. The Wagoneer stopped outside of the driveway and stared at Jane as she was trying to crawl from her car to get the attention of her friend. Once her friend came out and started loading her up to be brought to the hospital, the attacker drove off. Jane would survive this whole encounter after suffering a plethora of injuries such as a severed jugular, collapsed lungs, lacerated kidney, and several stabs and cuts throughout her body. The baby also miraculously survived as well. So why was this attack especially important? It's because it gives us a description of the possible Connecticut River Valley killer if these cases are all connected, and law enforcement very much believes that this to be the case. Now, Jane describes the man as between 30 to 40 years old, about 5 foot 7, with short blonde hair, and he was clean shaven. Now, this description sort of conflicts the other reports in which witnesses saw someone who looks suspicious, like in the Linda Moore case. Um, the suspect in the Linda Moore case was described as with dark hair, a stocky build, a round face, between the ages of 20 to 25 years old. He was also clean shaven, with dark rim glasses, like I mentioned. Um, however, I will go over the whole kind of separate reasons why there could be multiple descriptions in theories, so I'm not going to speculate that right now. Now, Jane has gone on to tell her story numerous times over the course of the years as the case has remained unsolved. She has done numerous interviews, and I want to provide her recounting of events of that day through an interview she did with the Murder, She Wrote podcast. Now, 
I will be reading her basically condensed version of the story um, that she did on this Murder, She Wrote podcast. Um, please keep in mind, I am not endorsing the Murder, She Wrote podcast. I merely f am using this for um, descriptive purposes and to help tell the story. Um, I'm not endorsing the podcast in any way, shape, or form, but I just want to throw that out there. I am using it as a resource. Now, this is the following quote and recount of events from Jane Borowski from that day. I pulled in, went to the vending machine, got my soda, and I noticed this vehicle pull in and parked right next to me on my passenger side of my car. I didn't think anything of it. I had no reason to think anything of it. As I was sitting in my car, drinking my soda, getting ready to pull out, he walked around the back side of my car asked me if the payphone worked, and opened my car door and tried to get me out of the car. As soon as he opened the door and tried to grab me out of the car, I screamed. I screamed so loud I broke blood vessels in my eyes. I was just shocked it was. I didn't have time to respond. As he was trying to pull me out of the car, I somehow got my feet up and I was kicking him, and I ended up kicking him and smashing in my windshield. The next thing I know, he takes a knife out and said calmly, maybe this will persuade you to get out of the car. Which it did. I got out of the car. I was like, what do you want? And he told me I beat up his girlfriend. Then I was really confused. I'm thinking, oh my god, this guy's a nutcase. He doesn't even know what he's talking about. So I was like, no, I don't know your girlfriend. And he said, isn't this a Massachusetts car? I have a New Hampshire car. So he kind of walked to the back of my car, like he was looking at the license plate. At that time, I didn't feel threatened because I thought maybe he just got confused and thought I was somebody else. The next thing I know, he starts walking to his vehicle, and I said these words that I will regret for the rest of my life. I said, Hey asshole, what about my windshield? Because he was walking away, and I have a smashed windshield. At the same time, I didn't feel threatened. I thought he'd just make made a mistake. And that's when he came back around to my side of the car where I was standing. He then put the knife, the knife up against my neck. And then that's when I knew I was scared again. I didn't know what he was capable of doing. I saw a vehicle drive by on the main road. And I knew I needed to run and scream for help. That was the only way I was going to get out of this situation. So I did. I dashed a dash for the road, screamed, yelled, tried to get their attention. They just drove right by. The next thing I know, he tackled me down like a football player. I was on my back on the pavement, and he was on top of me. And before I could even realize what was happening, he was stabbing me. It was almost like an out-of-body experience. I could not believe this was happening to me. I was pregnant, and I knew I had to protect my baby. So as he's stabbing, I'm trying to protect my baby and he just continued to stab for what felt like forever. And all of a sudden, it just stopped, and I'm lying there. I just couldn't believe that he just stabbed me like that. Then he he just calmly got up and walked away. I could hear him calmly walking. Then I heard the vehicle start, and I said to myself, Oh my God, I gotta get up. I gotta try and get out. I rolled over on my hands and knees and started getting up. He just so slowly drove right by my head and looked right down at me, and I looked right up at him, and he drove away. He didn't speed off, he just drove away. Now that is the end of the entire quote from the Murder, She Wrote podcast from the Jane Borowski interview. Now, after all of this, I want to dive into possible suspects. And then, obviously, some later findings that I kind of dug up while I was doing my research. And then, at the very end, we will get into theories. The first suspect we have is Delbert Tolman. Now, during the investigation into the death of Heidi Martin, Tolman actually confessed to the murder of Heidi Martin. However, he retracted his confession and claimed another man had killed her, but it wasn't him. Tolman did live in areas associated with some of the killings, but there is no evidence to say whether he did or did not commit some of the murders. To continue to add doubt to this, 
Tallman would have only been 16 when the first murder took place in 1978, and only 23 years old when the murder of Heidi Martin would take place. Tallman does not match the description given by Jane Borowski or the witnesses outside of Linda Moore's house. Tallman would be found not guilty in the murder of Heidi Martin, but was later arrested for a different crime in 1996. Now, the second suspect we have, and the suspect with the most evidence to point them to them even being the killer, is Michael Andrew Nicolau. Now, before I dive into Michael Nicolau, let's get to know Michael and pretty much how much this dude was a scumbag. Michael was originally from Long Island and did not have a great childhood growing up. During high school, Michael took up the martial arts, earning a black belt in karate and being on the high school wrestling team. He later enlisted in the army and served in Vietnam, where he received two Purple Hearts, two Silver Stars, and two Bronze Stars during his service. Sounds like a commendable guy, right? Not really. He was later discharged from the army for flying a helicopter too low, and wait for it, was caught killing civilians with three other soldiers in the Mekong Delta with grenades and machine guns. So, just let that sink in for a little bit. We're talking about somebody who has had a traumatic childhood, has a history of violence in doing martial arts with a black belt, and even a history of committing violent acts against other humans in, in terms of murdering innocent civilians while he was serving in Vietnam. When Michael Nicolau returned home, he was diagnosed with PTSD and was being treated at a VA hospital. So, like I mentioned, his taste of killing and violence started very early in his life, and it was made worse by his rough upbringing and mental illness. But anywho, strap your seatbelts on because there's a lot more to unpack with this one when it comes to piecing together the story and the theory behind how he became a suspect. How Michael Nicolau ended up being a suspect was through a deathbed confession by a man named Gary Westover. Westover was originally from Grafton, New Hampshire, and while on his deathbed, told his uncle, retired Grafton County Sheriff Deputy Howard Minnan, that he had witnessed the murder of a woman that he thought was Barbara Agnew. Westover was a paraplegic and told Minnan that three friends of his had loaded him and his wheelchair into their van for a night of drinking and cruising around Vermont around the time that Agnew had went missing. Now, Westover claims that his friends abducted and murdered a woman. Minnan shared this information with authorities, but it stalled and didn't seem to go anywhere. After all, this was just out of Westover's recollection of events, and there wasn't much evidence to support Westover's confession. However, this information was passed to an investigator working a separate case in Holyoke, Massachusetts. However, this investigator was putting together a case against Michael Nicolau for the supposed disappearance of his wife, Michelle. Michael ended up meeting a 20-year-old Holyoke native, Michelle, and getting married in 1988. Shortly after this, Michelle's parents were concerned as they noticed her personality changed after meeting him and getting married. Michelle expressed to her family that she wanted to leave him, and a lot of the issues were going on in their marriage that she was very concerned about, and so were her parents. However, she was scared to leave him, but was going to do so in December of that year after her sister's wedding. In December of 1988, shortly after her sister's wedding, Michelle would disappear. When questioned, Michael even dismissed the fact that he had married her and stated that she was a slut and ran off with a drug dealer. Michael took the kids, and, they, and he left. Their apartment was found abandoned, and the children recall being neglected and relocated numerous times. Now, before this, while Michelle and Michael were married, Michelle had family members that lived in the region of where the attacks took place, and even spent Christmas up in this area. Some other findings have pointed to the idea that Michael could be responsible for some of the killings. In addition to this, many people close to Michael said that he was trafficking drugs from Virginia and up into New England, even while the killings were taking place. Another interesting note of this is that Michael owned a Jeep Wagoneer with wooden panels, similar to the one Jane Borowski described as her attacker as driving. And a final tidbit to add to the, Nick, add to the theory that Nicolau possibly being the killer is that found 
In Michelle's baby book that they left abandoned in their apartment, the book states that they were at the same hospital Barbara Agnew worked at on Thanksgiving of 1986. Of course, Agnew would be killed in January of the following year. Does this paint a damning picture of Nicolau as a killer? Perhaps. However, we'll never be able to question him. That is because in 2005, while living in Florida with his new wife, Eileen Bowman, he killed both Bowman and his stepdaughter, and then himself in a murder-suicide. However, there are some loopholes with the theory that Nicolau was a killer. Borowski, during her recollection of events, originally thought the killer resembled Nicolau, but later retracted that statement, and now firmly believes that all these years later, that it wasn't Nicolau, but rather someone else entirely. Now, Nicolau being behind some of the killings would make sense. He was in that area a repeated number of times, and if the insight into him trafficking drugs was realistic as well, he would be making multiple trips through this area. The span of killings and timelines makes sense, especially if he was seeing his first wife, or correction, his second wife, it was not his first wife. Um, I originally put first in my notes and then realized that he got married before Michelle, so I just want to correct that. That's a mistake that I caught. Um, but while he was seeing his wife Michelle's relatives. Now, Nicolau does bear a resemblance to the figure described outside of the Moore residence in the Linda Moore case, however the description that Jane Borowski gave does not. Could there be multiple attackers? Perhaps someone seeing an opportunity to commit some crimes while another killer was active? Perhaps this could be the case. After the attempt on Jane Borowski, the attack stopped. Or at least that is what is believed, and that if it was Nicolau, this would make sense. Michelle would disappear in December of 1988, the same year the failed murder on Borowski would take place. Because of this failed attempt, perhaps Nicolau could have thought he was close to getting caught and decided to stop. Because after just a few months of just after a few months of this, his wife would disappear, with him being the primary suspect. However, this is only if Nicolau was a killer. Like I mentioned, Borowski doesn't think it was him. Now, the final wrinkle into all of this is the possible connection between Gary Westover and Michael Nicolau. When the information was passed along to the investigator looking into the disappearance of Michelle, it turns out that Michelle's parents had heard of Westover, and they actually lived the opposite street over from Westover's mother. When asked in relation to whether or not the two men could be connected in any way, Westover's aunts told investigators that the name Michael Nicolau had sounded familiar. It was rumored that Nicolau and Westover could have become acquainted by going to the same VA hospital. However, this was never confirmed. And with Westover passing away in 1988, we will never fully know this answer for certain. Now, with all of that information kind of scattered and laid out into, onto the table, let's get into theories as to who could be behind, could be behind all of this. Um, now, it could be safe to speculate that, obviously, Michael Nicolau sounds like the most likely culprit here, but obviously, um, there could be a variety of things going on here, and let's just dive into theories before I make my final call, um, but kind of keep all of this information that I've discussed in the back of your mind, especially the relation between um, Westover and Nicolau, could they have been related, could they have been um, co-conspirators in some way, again, kind of leave everything open um, as I get into theories here. Now, the first theory, and this first theory is going to be called Gary Westover's testimony. And why it's called Gary Westover's testimony is because Westover was a paraplegic. I don't think he could have done this. So his testimony stated that friend, his friends loaded him up into a van and that they went out and murdered somebody who, who met Barbara Agnew's description. So, in this theory, is it possible that the friends of Gary Westover could have done this? Based off his testimony, it seems that he was there on the night that Barbara Agnew was murdered, and not the others. Could it have been possible that it was his friends working together, and that they were doing this and perhaps they got into the thrill of the kill, so to speak, and kept up the act over numerous years? Now, it's important to note that if Westover and Nicolau knew each other, and Nicolau happened to be one of these friends that picked up Gary Westover the night that Barbara Agnew disappeared, this would insinuate that there are multiple people committing these murders. 
However, that that is again just me speculating and there is no evidence to back that up. Now, our second theory being Michael Nicolau. Now, this is the most realistic suspect. Could it all be him? There seems to be evidence pointing him out that he could be the killer. However, there is no evidence to support that he was in the area for all of the killings. Only some of them. But that could be explained if he was running drugs up through New England. That could put him realistically in the in the area over an extended period of time. Um, but again, the idea that he was running drugs is also just a speculation. So, kind of use that and be that as it may. Now, could it be, could it have been true that he was trafficking these drugs throughout this area and once he committed the first kill in 1978, obviously he being familiar with the idea of killing after his time in Vietnam, he gained a taste for it and decided that doing it all in an area that he was otherwise unfamiliar with would lead investigators to not suspect him. And if he was unfamiliar with the terrain of the area, it would make sense that he would use dumping sites that were close to each other and areas where he had dumped bodies previously because he already knew where to go. This is a big perhaps. Could the idea of Borowski describing somebody different be through the idea of false memories? Now, this is important. False memories can be generated through stress, trauma, or depression. Could this have played a role in, in Borowski's description of the attacker? Who knows? However, Borowski described the man with a different hair color and body shape compared to that as compared to that of Nicolau, so maybe, perhaps, it's back to the drawing board. Now, the third theory is somebody is a name that I have not mentioned yet, and after doing some research on, on Reddit and going through subreddits um, and looking into possible sus suspects, this name popped up. Now, this third theory is called Valentine Underwood. Now, like I said, this is someone whose name I have yet to mention in this episode. Valentine Underwood was a California-based serial killer. Valentine Underwood killed and raped two women in California in 1991 while as a Marine stationed there after returning from the Gulf War. Obviously, like I mentioned, I found Underwood through doing some research on Reddit in the Unsolved Mysteries subreddit, a discussion thread about the Connecticut River Valley Killer suggested him as a possible suspect, so I looked into it. However, before the California murders took place, Underwood was working oddball construction jobs in the New England area and has been charged with the rape and attempted murder of a 24-year-old nurse on May 20th of 1988 between the borders of New Hampshire and Massachusetts. The only reason the victim, whose name I could not find, perhaps for anon uh, anonymous reasons, survived because Underwood used a knife in the attempt to kill her in which the knife blade broke when he stabbed her, which most likely prevented him from outright killing her. After the violent act, Underwood, had, Underwood had dumped her body in a ditch along I-95, where she was found and made a full recovery from her injuries. Now, Underwood is currently serving in prison, where he is serving two life sentences for the murders in California, and including the charges he got from the New Hampshire incident. Could he be connected to some of the killings? Now, that is a big question mark. Obviously, the descriptions in the Linda Moore case doesn't point that way, as they described a white individual with black hair and black glasses, um, and Jane Borowski described, again, a white male with blonde hair, shorter, and clean-shaven. Now, that does not fit the profile of Valentine Underwood, as he was a, uh, a black man. Um, however, could he be responsible for some of the murders where there was no witnesses cited? Yes, that very well could be possible, because nobody saw the murders take place. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind that there was another serial killer in this area during this time period. Um, so again, it kind of leads back to the point that there is a lot of unanswered questions in this. And that is going to lead to our final theory. Now, our final theory being a combination. Maybe it was Nicolau and another killer acting in the area. Or perhaps totally unrelated killers. There were other serial killers who could have been in the area at this time of the murders, so it is unsure for certain who did this. However, I think it is the work of multiple people. Perhaps Nicolau was killing in the area, and when someone else noticed the string of killings, maybe they got gutsy and decided to try their luck as well. To me, this is where the evidence points to. And one thing is for certain is that we may never know who the real Connecticut River Valley killer was, 
but the impression left on the area is still felt to this day. Now, like I said, my theory being is that I think this is a combination. I think there is a lot of killings that point in the direction of Michael Nicolau being the killer, but I also think that there is some evidence pointing in the direction of these being possibly unrelated killings, or maybe another killer acting in the area. Um, however, I think that that's where the evidence points to. I think with Jane Borowski retracting her first statement of believing that the attacker could be Nicolau, and then saying that she doesn't think it is, and that it's someone completely different, um, adds a wrinkle into everything. But with that being said, my theory is that this is a combination of different suspects, combination of different killers. Um, and with that being said, I do have an image of the two police sketches. Um, the one that was described outside the Linda Moore home and the one that was made by Jane Borowski. I have both of those pictures and I will be posting them to my Instagram along with the special cover art for this week's episode. Um... I mentioned that on my Instagram, but I didn't plug it at the beginning. Um, but I do have unique cover art for all of my episodes now. Um, those will be exclusively on my Instagram, along with all photos relevant to this week's episode and all my previous episodes. However, with that being said, that is going to end this week's episode on the Connecticut River Valley Killer. Let me know what you think. Kind of let me know where your headspace is at, and who you think committed these murders. Um, but with that being said, if you are listening to this on Spotify, I am also on YouTube, so go ahead on YouTube, subscribe, you'll be notified every time that I post a new episode. And the same thing goes for YouTube. If you are listening to me on YouTube, and you have Spotify, and you're like, wow, I didn't realize he was on Spotify. Go ahead on Spotify, follow me there, turn on notifications, so you'll get notified every time I post a new episode, um, and I greatly appreciate it. And another little tidbit, I do t also take episode suggestions. Feel free to send those to my email at unblurringtheunknown at gmail.com. Um, but with that being said, that is going to conclude today's episode. Thank you for tuning in, and I will see you on the next one.